Good evening. Welcome to Hope Looks Up Bible Study with Dr. Tom Haney on January 24th, 2022. Tonight is our fourth lesson of the, our study titled, Fear Does Not Need to Control You, Finances and Our Times. Tonight's lesson is titled, Are the World's Finances Trending Toward a One World System? And the scripture is Matthew 6, 24 and Revelation chapters 14 through 18. Thank you for attending both on Zoom and on YouTube. Our meeting consists of two parts, teaching and prayer time. Prayer time will follow teaching and is optional, but available to those who have urgent prayer needs. Please refer to the Hope Looks Up website, hopelooksup.org, for Bible study schedules, previous study resources, and Hope Looks Up ministry events. That's hopelooksup.org. We will begin with a word of prayer, followed by Dr. Tom Haney. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to study your word with our leader, Dr. Tom Haney. May he shed light on our financial issues of our time and how they relate to the conditions of the end times. We are blessed to have the many prophecies that give us the glimpse of what's to come. May your spirit be with us as we seek the truth through your study. In Jesus' name, amen. Tom? Thank you, Chuck, and it's a pleasure to greet everyone tonight. Uh, so glad that you're here and glad to get some good reports about uh, being uh, negative with COVID now. And so just continue to uh, know that we're praying for everybody to to be healthy and, uh, and to be not, uh, certainly not caught up in all the disappointing things that COVID brings. So I want to address something tonight that I think can be a great concern for some Christians and has actually caused great fear from time to time throughout history. Uh, it is something that is uh, the fact when we get into talking about the end times and people begin talking about specifics that are happening that make them feel that it is the end times and begin to quote, you know, wars, rumors of wars, uh, the increase in earthquakes, the increase in tornadoes, just any of these increase in technology, uh, restoration of Israel and where that's going. Many times they talk about that and then do not really discuss how should we live in those times leading up to the actual tribulation, the truly last seven years of life here on the earth. This especially affects the areas of Christian works. And so people have been have had a lot of difficulty through the years asking, should we pray differently? Uh, should we fast and abstain from uh, things differently? Uh, should we give and handle our finances differently? Should we change our Bible reading style that we're doing? And this list uh, can be almost endless. Tonight, we're going to take another look at why fear does not have to control you. I want to discuss what the Bible says about a Christian handling their finances in the kind of environment that we're talking about leading up to the last days upon this earth. A brief look at history shows that these great times of tribulation and tumult have, and thinking that Jesus was coming back soon, have been hard times for Christians to sort out this answer. Interestingly enough, we I grew up in an area where three or four different times that's been sort of the center of people forming uh, communes. And several communes were formed during hardship, trauma, expectation of the Lord coming back where individual families would give up their finances, would sell their property, would belong to a group and live together in that commune to wait together for the coming of the Lord. We've seen historically Christian people moving out of cities and towns and into more rural and pastoral areas, especially those that are more remote and simplistic. We've seen people leave one state and migrate to another. Uh, from Illinois to Independence, from Independence to Salt Lake City. We've seen other groups not as large as the Mormons also migrate during these times where they feel this is happening. And we have seen people actually move from a advanced country to a more simplistic country. We've seen people fund great projects that they deemed would not necessarily keep the people from, from a, a doom, but would allow them to have a, an easy way of passing through this difficult time uh, of what might happen before Christ actually comes. 
So I guess the question I want to ask tonight is, are these biblical? Yes, they've all been done. And they've been done many times. But is there a Bible basis for this? Did Jesus really say, as the day approaches, uh, I want you to all uh, go live in a commune? He did say, be careful of coming down off of the housetop. He did also talk about some of the things that would be negative. But did Jesus really feel the fulfillment of doing some special specific things if they believe the end times were really here was what he wanted to do. Well, let's, let's just lay a foundation for our study tonight. First of all, I hear a lot of people say, well, I just don't believe in, I don't, I don't like prophecy. They don't say they don't believe in it, but I don't like it. I don't like to study it. It's so negative. It's such a, a downer. I, I, I'd rather not think about those sort of things. I'd rather just focus on the gospel. Or I'd rather focus on this or focus on that. But we need to realize that understanding Bible prophecy and discerning the signs of the times are all things that Jesus told us and prompted his followers to do. He said, know the times, know the seasons, know what's happening so that it doesn't catch you unexpected or it doesn't cause a, a lot of difficulty in your life. Given that fact, we should all consider how living in the season of the Lord's return would have an impact on our own finances. There are several eternal perspectives that never change. First of all, biblical stewardship. The handling of all that we have been given means that we must always handle our time, our talents, and our treasures according to the instructions of God. The things that people most are alert about and concerned about are all signs of the times. And we need to realize they don't change the times. They're just signals or signs for us to be aware. These include signs of nature, Luke 21, 11, the condition of society, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 4, the spiritual condition of the society, of the church, 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, the state of the world politics, Matthew 24, 6 and 7, the advanced great events of technology, Luke 21, 26, and also Daniel 12. And even Israel being back in its original land, Zechariah 12, 3. There's many scriptures that back each one of those groups of signs. So the question for tonight is, how should we live in this season of the Lord's return? And how should that impact our finances and the way that we handle them? It would be good for us to remember and remind ourselves what the Bible means when it talks about being a good steward of your life. It truly means that you handle your time, your talents, and your treasure, just like God said. We have to realize that part of the prophecy is not only to predict what will happen in the events of the world, but prophecy also tells you what will happen in your life if you take the options God has or if you take different options. That's why the underlying truth about handling finances in any time is to remember God owns it all. What you do with your finances keep them, hold them back in some areas while you decide what to give, or give only what you want, all must still operate under the law that God owns it all. You can do all that you want. That's true. You can say, I'm in total charge of my money. Here's where I'm going to give. Here's what I'm going to do. And here's how I'm going to do it. But you know what? That makes you then act like you are the owner. And that God at the best is a made up word here, suggestor. God suggests that I give to these things, but, you know, I'm going to really do what I want to do. We have no guarantee from the Bible that we get benefits from that. We may benefit the organizations we give to. We just don't have a Bible guarantee that we, that we have blessings coming from that. We do have a Bible guarantee that we have blessings when we're cheerful givers. And we are promised two things biblically. One, we're going to be blessed just as he promised. In his word, he will pour out his blessings upon us. And two, he will put a hedge of protection around us that will guard and keep us. Jesus reminded us all of how strong the chains of materialism can be, how they can be wrapped around our bank account, our credit score, and even our desire for more and more. But here's what he said in Luke 12, 15. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance 
does his life consist of his possessions? Wow. So even when your life is full of all these possessions, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have an abundance of God's blessing. The most important thing about our stewardship of time is that we do what God says. We give him a healthy portion of our time. The Bible says to redeem our times, and you know, we can do that. We can't redeem anybody else's time. I suppose as parents, we try pretty hard to redeem our children's time. You know, please get off the off your phone and uh, get this work done. Or uh, we might even uh, have um, enough authority at work to redeem the time of our coworkers or the people under us. But we certainly can redeem our time. We don't. We can take those times where we squandered and wasted in the past, and we can use it usefully. We can redeem the time we have to bless others, to bless ourselves, and most of all, God. And I think that's what God wants us to do when he says, be a steward of our time. It doesn't mean that we have to spend so many hours in prayer or so many hours going to church or so many hours in spreading the gospel, but we need to make sure that God has a portion of our time, that we've redeemed it, and we're doing things that bless him and bless others. Talents. And sometimes I think we forget that talents vary from season to season of our life. If you don't believe that's true, just listen to a singer who used to be good. You know, time has eroded their voice, uh, their condition has eroded, maybe they drank or did something else, has eroded how they sound. And uh, we need to realize talents vary from season to season of our life. We just have to make sure that we do the best of what is given to us and use some of that in the ministry of God and helping other people. And we may reach a point where our talent is writing notes, calling on the phone. I've certainly in my lifetime seen people whose invalid condition has reduced them to only a handful of things. But I tell you, I've remembered many of them because their notes were amazing. Their calls were personal. Their ways of touching you were great. So Whatever you can still do well, make sure God gets a portion of that in your talents. We will never get more talents by banking and locking up with the talents that we have, but only in letting them be used by God for good and always given graciously on our part. I want to spend some time tonight because I think it's the area that affects us most in this whole concept of this season before the end times. Uh, and obviously, we are in the end times, the latter days. That's Jesus said that from the first te- from the New Testament on. But as we see the signs progress towards tribulation and towards the very end of life, how, how should we, how should that affect how we act? Well, I want us to see that we need to use our treasure in times like this season we're in. It's good to remember that our message from God about our stewardship has been true. It was always been true when people were under persecution involved in war, living through a depression, living through crop failures, living through factory closings, living through depressed times of where they were at. In other words, what God has said about stewardship can be applied to every time in our life, and it's always the right way to go. To follow the Bible, regardless of the times, signs of the times, is really what God wants us to do. I know a lot of people are not happy with the command of God to tithe, but it's hard to make that word mean offerings or gifts or whatever you want or can give. The word tithe literally means the tenth part. It is very clear that God expected his people to give at least a tenth so that they, of what they earn, to charity and support the work of the Lord. You can give 1%, 3%, 5%, 7% or any other portion, and you can call it a tithe, but it's not a tithe unless you give 10%. I served in a new church in Indianapolis, a church that I helped, I founded, and, and we were sharing, had a wonderful Sunday night worship service. It was so warm and inviting. We had a sharing and prayer time in it in which, even though we had 250 people there, everybody who wanted to shared, and we prayed over specific things. And one night we had this young lady who had just joined our church that year and started attending, who was married to a non-practicing Jewish dentist. And uh, he allowed her to come, allowed her to bring the kids. And she said, I want to share a blessing tonight. 
I really want to share a blessing. She said, my husband has agreed that this year, our tithe will go from 2% to 3%. Now, it wasn't any time to really talk about that. We all rejoiced. That was really great. And I loved her enthusiasm and her joy over the stewardship money. I was in her home just a few months later when she came on Sunday night and she said, I think my husband's ready to accept Jesus. And so I drove, I followed her out to their community in the east, southeast part of Indianapolis. And he was, he was ready to be led to the Lord. It's just kind of a matter of me kind of going through the steps of salvation. And he was very, very uh, willing and welcome to do that. And I said, as the three of us sat down and talked about being Christian life, and something came up about giving, and I explained that the tithe was really 10% of what you make. This man, a non-attending Jew, but who was familiar with Hebrew words and, and Hebrew uh, teaching, was very, to me, says, well, I know that. He said, everyone knows that the tithe is 10%. God set out that principle very clearly in Leviticus 27.30, which says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. I see three strong applications that God included when he commanded the tithe. I got them on here. First, the tithe belongs to God. Sorry. Um, later in the Bible, in Malachi, God asked the question through Malachi, will a man rob God? And answers that question by saying, but you've robbed me by taking the tithes and the offerings. You're under a curse, he said, your whole nation, because you've been robbing me. God challenges them to bring that whole tithe into the storehouse of the Lord. In other words, 10%, not some other percentage, not something that they might seek to do. He will open the storehouse of heaven, he says then, and pour out for them so many blessings that they will not have enough room to store them. Thus, chiding from God to his people, and the challenge is linked to a promise to more than match in blessings what they bring in ties. Ought to, uh, and it occurred at a terrible time in the history of Israel. That's why when people say, well, I don't know, we're in these end times, should we be really be doing this? The nation was not sound spiritually. The priests and other religious leaders were not giving spiritually what they should do. They were bad stewards. They were about to let the land be captured. The prophets were warning that God was going to let the temple be destroyed. Yet God challenges them about not tithing and challenges them to bring the tithe and see what happens. It seems that intertwined in this exchange between God and this nation of Israel was the promise that even to the terrible things that had been prophesied, they would not happen to them. They would be lifted if they would restore worship, sacrifice, stewardship, marrying only believers, and other things that Malachi says they were not doing right. God would actually save their land. Now, we know in tribulation times, that's not going to be true because the devil is going to set a course that he's going to finalize things here upon this earth. But that doesn't mean that God will not have special favors for his believers who continue to give and who continue to, to live and who continue to uh, affect themselves in a way of trying to do the things that God sets out them to do. Second of all, we need to realize that the tithe is holy. It is what God intended for you to give. So it's been marked by God as already belonging to him. Have you ever wondered if the tithes you are hoarding to give to something you really believe in might be taken by God for other things that arise? I really believe that happens. Did that retained tithe money pay the body shop for the car wreck you had? Did that retained tithe money go to purchase the two appliances that just went out in the house? Did your retained tithe money go to health needs, family needs, to the upkeep of your house, or maybe another area of need and expense? God may not have gotten the tithe, but since it was earmarked for God for you to return it to him, it's gone. I have seldom seen God allow the money that was uh, supposed to go to a tithe to gather interest and multiply for the person who withholds the tithe. Third, the tithe is set apart. That means that it is to be presented to God and therefore not used for any other purpose. 
I've often heard preachers and teachers say emphatically that the tithe should go to the local church and only gifts and offerings above the tithe should go to any other charitable work. I personally do not find biblical support for that teaching. I know that they talk about, well, the local church has to be supported. And Paul said, don't rob the local church, but give these special offerings to, to take back to Jerusalem. But the Bible also says that all Christians are to support widows and orphans. And if you're going to the local church and they're not supporting widows and orphans, then I think we're commanded to do something in that area too. I believe that you should give to your local church and you should support them with what you can. But some people feel that God has just allowed them to stay with the church, to be leavened, to help change that church for good. And they don't see that the money given to that church is being used for Christian activities. So I think you should support your local church. Sharon and I certainly do. And I think you should also support other charities, charities that carry out the mission that God has put in your heart for you to do. I have, Sharon and I have supported about a dozen of those on a regular basis. I have supported research and development for cancer for years. I don't have any close family members who've had cancer, although we did have a scare a few years ago when we thought Sharon had breast cancer. But I see it as an insidious disease that destroys homes and cripples families. And I'm very happy to be a contributor to the Breast Cancer Research Fund, to the Cancer Society, and also to the Cancer Association. Since we're regular and generous, generous contributor, contrib contributors to those groups the past few years, we've been getting many appeals that ask us to support finding a cancer cure that we have since found is probably a scam. They call the group the American Breast Cancer Coalition. They do not try to actually address breast cancer, and maybe some of you have gotten this call. We've gotten this call dozens of times. They do not actually try to address curing breast cancer. It, uh, they have a woman, at least a feminine voice, calls and claims that the goal of the group's fundraising is to support legislators who will fight for the fast track approval of saving breast cancer health bills and breast cancer treatment drugs to the FDA. I've always said that I wanna to give to research and development, R&D, and I don't want my money to go to political associations of any sorts. I do not think that giving to political groups is tithing stewardship. Yes, I think you should give to political groups you wanna to give to, but I don't think you should call that the tithe, and I certainly don't think you should call that a special gift to God. I recently read in a report by Roger Solenberger and Anna Masangilia, who wrote this in October 15, 2021, that the group I'm speaking about, the ABCC, has raised $3.57 million over the past two years for their cause, but that the ABCC has also paid almost every dollar it has raised to fundraising paid those to fundraising companies, all but 2,000. That means 3.56 million plus has gone to these fundraising companies. And you might say, well, why is that true? Well, many of these fundraising companies are linked back through some ties to this fundraising group so that it's almost like it supports the fundraising group by raising money from these small donors. It turns out that it is really a scam pack, in my opinion. It is now registered as a 527 or a political group. That's their choice. The government didn't ask them to do that, they did it. It's a tax exempt nonprofit that is supposed to operate primarily to influence the selection, nomination, election, appointment, or defeat of candidates for federal, state, or public office. Others operating in these heart-tugging issues include law enforcement, wounded veterans, firefighters, children with disabilities, and each of these PACs also plow almost every dollar collected back into fundraising. Well, you might ask, why are they switching from a nonprofit registered with FEC to a nonprofit that registers with the IRS? Lloyd Mayer, a nonprofit law expert at the University of Notre Dame Law School, explained why the change poses a new hurdle. The obvious reason to move away from being a federal political committee 
to a 527 is that the FEC actually had a full staff look at all the reports that were filed. He goes ahead and says the IRS could do that in theory, but they don't. Meyer says, noting that the available IRS staff already stretched thin, creates an order of magnitude too large for them to also cover these groups. The investigation allowed that the connection between these companies and known scammers was obvious. And the larger network realities reaches more than a dozen states. The most saturated are Florida, New Jersey, Georgia, Nevada, Texas, Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee. But I can tell you they're in Arizona because at least three of these groups have constantly called us in the last two years. Over the years, these companies have netted tens of millions of dollars, if not more, from sham groups like the ABCC. So if our tithe is to be set apart for the work of the Lord, and never a knee-jerk reaction to what we hear on media or solicitation appeals other than maybe what you know is genuine, we need to examine the money that we give as a tithe, examine the churches and nonprofit organizations that we support. I would encourage you to visit and watch the ministry in action. So if you want to support Teen Challenge, go down and spend a morning at Teen Challenge and have one of the administrators walk you through and show you the ministry. Watch the, go sit in on the chapel service as the, as the young men are led uh, to, to talk about the Lord. Or if you want to support St. Mary's, you want to know more about it, call and set up an appointment. They'll walk you through St. Mary's. They'll show you all the things that they're doing and on and on. I think it's, it's good for us to, to, to know this. After all, we are to redeem not only the time, we're also to redeem the tithe. I believe that tithing is not a part of the law because the practice began long before the law. It was given, uh, was given to Moses. Abraham tithed to the high priest. In fact, if you'll remember, Cain and Abel got into trouble because their tithe was one well accepted by the Lord and one not accepted by the Lord. So we need to recognize that tithing began at creation, the law began when Moses was getting the children of Israel out of Egypt and taking them to the land of Israel to live there. We know that also Jacob promised to tithe to the Lord in Genesis 28, 22. The principle of giving back to God who blesses us represents what is best for the people of God at all times and under all circumstances. So we can give only offerings, that's less than a tithe. We can give just a tithe, we can give a tithe plus offerings, or we can give proportional giving. And you say, Pastor Tom, what's that? Well, that's giving even more as a tithe as we become more financially blessed and realize that we can live really well on 85% of our income or 80% of our income. And somebody else could use the, the other 10 or 20. So how should a Christian approach giving and stewardship in this time leading to tribulation? Remember, Jesus in Matthew 6 told us to store up treasures in heaven. Why are earthly investments called fleeting by our Lord? Because your wealth on earth is only temporary. It will leave you while you live, or you will leave it when you pass. The Bible contains 2,350 verses that discuss the handling of finances. It's a big competitor to Jesus Christ for the love and devotion of Christians. There's a strong relationship between how someone handles money and how they live out their Christian life and prepare for the Lord's second coming. How you handle your finances is an external visible indicator of the condition of your heart and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's important to know that how you handle finances is a spiritual nature. I like what Proverbs 27, 19 says, as water reflects the face, so a man's heart reveals the man. In this season of the Lord's return, we should increase our giving because of the imminent expectation of the Lord's return for his people. A good question to ask ourselves is, are we storing up finances beyond what you need or what is reasonable? We as believers need to pray about this and do what the Holy Spirit leads us to do. After all, Jesus said, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, is God going to trust you with true riches? For followers of Jesus Christ living in the season of the Lord's return, the time to give is growing shorter every day. 
if not by the Lord's second coming, at least by our going home to be with the Lord. So I would encourage you to follow what God lays on your heart and make sure that you respond with a yes and a tithe and an offering to meet the number that God gives to you. Be the steward that God wants you to be. We hold fast to the promises that God has made to us. Let's also make sure that we hold fast to the promises that we have made to God. God loves his creation. He intends to redeem it, all of it, and not destroy it with some mystical blast or big bang. The idea that somehow the world will be annihilated and people will just disappear has zero Bible backing to it. Jesus died on the cross not only to redeem mankind, but also to redeem creation and this earth. So the high priest in the Old Testament sprinkled blood not only on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, but also by command of God in Leviticus 16.15, he sprinkled it on the ground in front of the Ark. It had two points. The blood on the mercy seat of the Ark was a prophecy promising that, that the tablets inside of it, the Ten Commandments, which could not be kept by anybody, would be covered by the blood of Jesus and would allow the mercy and grace of God to forgive us of the commands that we knew we would never be able to keep. The blood on the ground was a reminder that the sacrifice of Jesus would make it possible for the curse to be lifted from the earth, from the animals, from the plant kingdoms, to be returned to their original perfection. So Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, talks about the time when the lion and the lamb, well, actually says the wolf and the lamb, the, the, uh, the snake and the child, uh, all of these things would, would be back in harmony. And also the plants would be back in harmony. Be no coniferous carnivorous animals or carnivorous plants. Now, that's really not heaven. People that say, well, that has to be talking about heaven. Uh, no, those are still temporal things. Those are still things that are going to live and die. They're, they're not eternal things. They have not received an eternal new body. Romans 8, 18 through 22 explains the very same thing, that God would redeem the earth. Now, 1 Peter 3, you say, Pastor Tom, 1 Peter 3 says, the earth will be destroyed by fire. Well, yes, it will be destroyed by fire. It will be cleansed by fire. But the Bible also said the earth was destroyed by the flood. But you know what? We still live on that earth that was destroyed by the flood. And the earth is destroyed by the fire. We will live on it as well in what the Bible calls the millennial kingdom. Because Christ will redeem the earth. He will redeem the animal plant kingdom the plant kingdom, Christ will redeem everything that he has created. That's why he wants us to be a good steward of all these things, because God is a good steward of everything he has made. He, he will put it back into the form that he actually created it in. The Old Testament ends with an example of what I'm talking about. It's in Malachi 4, and it starts out this way in Malachi 4.1. The day is coming burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day is coming that will set them ablaze. That's the bad news for unbelievers. That's also the bad news for the cleansing of this, of this earth. But the very next verse contains incredibly good news for believers. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you shall go forth and skip and run and bound like calves released from the stall. Malachi 4.2. I want us to see then that one of the things that I think God is wanting us to do is not let fear control us as far as how are we going to make it in the season leading up to the end times. After all, the same God who provided for us in other seasons of our life will provide for us in those seasons of our life. I'm sure all of us have gone through some times where we didn't really necessarily have enough money that year to make it through the year, but God provided ways that we made it through the year well. And God will do the same. We just need to link our stewardship with him. 
And we need to make sure that we are redeeming the things that we're doing, that our time, our talents, especially our treasures, are going to the things that would absolutely bless God's kingdom, that would cause more to come to Christ, that would allow Christ to be, to be further uh, spread throughout the world that we know, and that we would be generous and kind and loving in those times. Well, join us next week. We're going to take a long look at current events, and we're going to ask ourselves the question that was behind today's lesson. Is our world trending towards a one-world system? Is there anything we should be doing to stop that? Is it something that we should be encouraging, discouraging? And what about world finance? Are we just kind of to sit back and let it go to a, a one world finance? Once again, fears that I think sometimes we wrestle with, that I think God has some scriptural answers. We look at current events, but then we'll apply scripture to those current events. Oh, God bless you. Thank you for listening to this program on finding out how Christians should handle their finances in these times. And I know God will bless you and God will continue to help you and God will allow you his peace and his encouragement. I ask you to uh, lean on that. Trust in that. God loves to keep his promises. Chuck, I'm going to turn it back to you at this time. Well, thank you again, Tom. Another good lesson. Uh, it's, it's a good reminder that we do need to invest in God's kingdom, and, and sometimes we forget that. And there's so many distractions or things that we can, we can uh, spend our money on, and sometimes we forget that there's a, a better place for that investment. Uh, we'll be posting tonight's lesson on the Hope Looks Up YouTube site on Thursday. For those who would like to participate, the prayer team will, uh, the time will begin now with uh, Kathy, and I'll stop the recording. Thank you.